We now turn to issues of learning activities, which we've actually mentioned before, uh, basically to point out that there are many different kinds of translation activities that can be incorporated into teaching. But here I want to look at them, especially from the perspective of interaction, of who is interacting with whom and to what effect. This fits into our ideal world as follows. From the learning outcomes, we know that we can develop lesson plans, and in those lesson plans, we have activities. And uh, I think it's important to insist uh, on those activities as the building blocks of the way our, our classes and our syllabi are put together. How do you teach? This is the fundamental question. And we haven't spoken about it very much. It's been sort of theory. How should you plan to do everything? How should you think about what you should do? How do you teach? This is what Dorothy Kelly says. Just some homely advice. A few obvious pointers, perhaps. This is Dorothy over here. The theory says all activities have to be related to outcomes. So that's good theory, but, you know, lots of other things can happen. Uh, Kelly insists a lot that when you're teaching a class, you must relate it to what the students have acquired already and to their personal experience as well. And you have to be able to keep them interested by pointing out that we are moving towards things that they don't yet know about. And this is the uh, famous uh, Russian pedagogical theorist Vygotsky's uh, zone of proximal development. We have to keep everybody in this zone where they can understand things because of the information they already have, and they're moving on to things that they don't yet understand or fully uh, uh, dominate. Uh, and uh, that zone is where learning activity happens. It's very difficult to create and maintain for a diverse group of learners. And good teaching is par partly uh, trying to make sure that that zone of proximal development, that you, you feel you are developing and you're not entirely lost, uh, the, the task is to make that work for everybody in the class. So, for example, in a normal class, I'll start off in really easy things at the beginning and everybody will get bored. No, some people will be learning there. And then at the beginning of the second hour, if I have a two-hour class, I'll throw in something that is very difficult and abstruse and will suddenly wake up all those people who are thinking, gee, I know all of this stuff already. Other people have different ways of managing that. It's good in that sense, if you're working on that zone of development, to connect it with readings that should have been done prior to class. And the readings should be short because students tend not to do them if they're long. So Kelly, I think, recommends short readings of about 10 pages. Trouble is, unless you require them or unless you're going to ask questions on the readings, you don't do it, do you? Well, some of you do if you're really interested in the topic. So one way to do it is to start off from what's in the readings or incorporate the readings into the class activity. Kelly recommends visual support. We're using a PowerPoint here. Actually, her book's so old, she's talking about overhead projectors and, and printed uh, photocopied handouts, things we don't tend to use these days. Visual support is good simply because people tend to lose attention if it's one person talking. You can look at the picture if you're getting bored or wonder what's coming up next down here. It's uh, just a way of, 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 of maintaining attention over a period of time. Kelly's most important recommendation, I think, is that if you're going to use a lecture-type format with one person speaking, it should be for no more than 15 minutes at a time. 
This is impeccable advice. And we all break that rule, and I'm going to break it here. Right now I'm going to speak for more than 15 minutes. We did uh, an experiment where we had uh, translation teachers working in the translation class, and we sat at the back of the class and we did a map of who is speaking with whom, who's interacting with whom, and we draw, drew uh, an interaction map with all the different arrows going, and we kept a track of the time. And then at the end of the class, we would ask the teachers, well, how many minutes do you think you talked for, you spoke for? How many minutes were there for student-to-student -student interaction? Uh, how, many, how much time was there for students speaking to the whole class? And the teachers would always get it wrong. They would always estimate that they spoke for about half the time that they really spoke for. Everybody thinks they're, they're into student-centered learning. Let the students speak. Let the students work with each other. But when you get down to it and look at their practice, wow, well, we all like the sound of our own voice. And we all speak for far more than that. If you can reduce your input to under 15 minutes at a time, what does that mean? It means that you have to have other kinds of activities there where you are not the person speaking. I note in passing that the Christian church knows about this. The general limit for a sermon in church, which is when the priest talks to the people in the church, uh, the guideline is that should never go for more than 20 minutes because after 20 minutes people fall asleep or start wondering about their lunch or other things. In the 15 minutes, Kelly recommends using repetition. She says, remember, students are taking notes, so you can say the same thing in various different ways. And all teachers tend to do this. It, it never fails to amaze me that if I got this PowerPoint and just read it out, I could read it all in probably five minutes. But to explain it might take about 35 minutes. Oh, you can stop it if it's too long. It's okay, all right? And she says, this is good because you have to remember that students are taking notes, so you must allow them time to take notes. Personally, I don't care if students take notes. You've got the PowerPoints. You can refer back to everything. Sometimes, though, note-taking helps the student concretize what's going on. Uh, 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 I don't know, though. I, I was giving some lectures what, last year at first-year level at the university. No, I wasn't giving. I was coordinating. And I went to the back of the room, a huge, huge lecture, lecture theatre. It's like a typing pool. There are all these students typing out everything that the lecturer says. I can't understand. Why would anybody do that? Okay, if that helps you do it, fine. You, you're interacting with the material and you can read it later. These days, though, we've got the recorded interviews, recorded, the recorded lectures, the, the PowerPoints. You, know, you can go back to material very easily. Bottom line is, uh, speak as little as possible. Even though you're getting paid, the less you do, the better you are in general. When I began teaching in a translation school many years ago, I remember being in a class and I really didn't know how to do it. I was lost. I, I didn't have a textbook. I was translating. But the students were at very, very different levels, and, and I really felt lost. I just didn't know what to do. And so I asked the students, who is the best teacher? And they all said, this man here, Willi Neunzig, who uh, actually died in 2019 and is very fondly remembered, not just by me, but by all his colleagues and all his students over the years. Uh, so I asked Willy, can I sit in on some of your classes? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. And I sat there and I learnt, perhaps not how everybody should teach, but I learnt some tricks about teaching. 
And one of them is this, you don't have to be serious all the time. That the students are there, not just to get what they can, they can read the knowledge in a book these days. They, they can go to a YouTube video for most of what we do. But if they're coming to class, it's because it's fun. Uh, there are jokes, it's a performance, it's a show, and Vili's class was a show. He would play with... Ah, oh, it sounds bad, doesn't it? I'll just give you one example. Uh, I remember this is the first, first class I went in there, and he would pretend to know everybody's name. So he would all call all the women Monse. Monse, answer this question, please. I'm not Monse, sir. <gasps> you look like Monse. Well, who's Monse? That's over there. But you look like her, don't you? Yes, you must be Monse. No, I'm not. I'm Maria. All right. Silly, silly little interactions. Silly games. They were all there. They were all paying attention. And I think they learned some German along the way, or German translation. Okay? You don't have to be serious all the time. You don't have to stand in one place and, and speak. You can move around the class and, and interact with people uh, in many different ways on a many different levels. Mm. It's a show and the students should feel part of it. And a good trick that Vili taught me and that I always fail at is you, you should learn the students' names and, and make a big effort to learn their names at the beginning so they feel they're a part of the show. I'm really bad at that and I feel guilty all the time. The teaching manuals usually say things like your class doesn't finish in the class. Uh, once you finish the lesson you should hang around a bit or walk away slowly. Be approachable because lots of people are going to come up to you and ask for things after class and they should feel able to do that. The class doesn't finish with the class. Okay. Other things I've learned, it's in the textbooks, but you tend to forget about it, but this has served me very well. It's a show, but it's not you. Your personal life should never enter into your professional life in any way. Uh, and I've stuck to that ethics throughout my life, and it served me well. When you're going through a really tough time in your personal life, you get on there, it's like being on stage. You become a different person, you get out of yourself. It's good for you, it's good for the students. And it took me many years to learn to say this, I don't know, when I really don't know, or even if I'm not too sure. These days I can say that to students, I don't know, let's find out. Or I don't know, please look that up now. That's, you know, please go, go and do an internet search and find something. Uh, gone are the days when the teacher is the uh, repository of knowledge that is being fed out to students, as Corelli puts it with his diagrams. Obviously, knowledge is out there for everybody to discover. Your role is to help them discover it. And saying, I don't know, is a key to that. Now I turn to interaction. Interaction is just who you're communicating with. And it's usually two-way, even if only one person is speaking. In uh, interaction analysis, for example, we can look at a, a range of back channels. If I'm speaking to you now, uh, and if we were face-to-face, -face, you would perhaps be doing things with your eyes, with your head, nodding. Uh, when you are looking at people, you know who is in agreement with you, you know who is lost, you know who's dozing off at the back of the class. Eye contact is so important for that. It, it is interaction, it's never just one way. So these, these are photos I took years and years ago when we had these big horrible computers in the, in the translation class. We did have color photography. <laughs> I just made them black and white for publication. But anyway, full frontal teaching. Teacher at the front of the class saying things. This is, should, this is where the 15-minute limit is for. Why is it there? Well, there is content to present, and you explain instructions for the activities. You can answer questions, so it can be interactive. The students ask, and you answer when you can. 
and you can ask the students and they respond to you. And at the end of an activity, this is the space in which you sum up uh, the results of the activity for the whole group. Okay? Yes, based on readings and previous activities, 15 minutes, and the general rule is we do it more than we should and more than we think we do. Okay? We know about that. Teaching is not really that. I mean, it's part of it. But a lot of the real teaching comes in other kinds of interaction. Here's what I'm calling over-the-shoulder interaction. You can see here the students are working in groups. These two over here are working together on the translation. This girl here is stuck. The teacher comes up and points something out to her and helps her. So you can ask, not just answering questions, but you can come along and see what people are doing, see how they're progressing through the task, and give advice where necessary. So it's a very ad hoc kind of teaching. Uh, it's also useful to do that to check if instructions have been understood. Often they haven't, and this is how you pick it up when you're into the activity. And you can give help to those who need it. This obviously is better in small groups, but you can manage to do it in larger groups. And one of the good things about online learning is you can get to everybody easily. Whereas architects used to design these computer lab type spaces where it was very hard to get to everybody at the risk of great personal damage in some cases. Things are getting better though. Peer to peer teaching or student to student teaching is when students are working together. So here we saw the people who were in the background before and here they're looking at the one screen and discussing how to translate or how to solve problems. They are learning in small groups. It could be two, three, or four. Above four, it's rather difficult, but sometimes we do that. And you give not just knowledge, but support, especially with technology. People get blocked. Oh, what am I doing? I feel silly. What do I do? I click on everything. Often, if there are two of you, you, you don't panic quite as much. That is, you might think a bit before clicking on everything. Peer-to-peer -peer is absolutely essential for learning the basics of teamwork skills and that means a certain amount of trial and error. That is, you figure out how to work with people you don't really like, how to work with people who are telling you what to do all the time, how not to tell people what to do all the time. Okay, uh, these basic negotiation and, and human skills, human interaction skills are, are very difficult if you don't have them naturally. There are always problems there. Look, we can give advice to everybody, but in the end, you figure it out by being in this kind of situation and uh, building up your own lessons on the basis of experience. Typically, the instructions are given, the small groups work, and then they report back to the whole group. So you get uh, exercise in presentation skills uh, there as well. This kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction is probably the least frequent. If you, When we did our maps of the class, you know, we thought that the class was based on peer-to-peer -peer interaction, but it was always much less than what we thought, and it tends to be scored uh, unfavorably. Uh, I think because it's done badly. All right. The most valuable scores, because we, we they did interviews with everybody after this, uh, this year-long experiment, and uh, we asked them what kind of interaction they benefit from the most. This uh, peer-to-peer, they benefited when they were different. Uh, that is, when uh, one person had Spanish, in this case, as L1, and the other person had English. And they could work together and help each other with the languages. And that's, that's a superb case of tandem learning. Something similar might happen if we have people with a translation background and then people with a language education background push you together. You can effectively teach each other the things that the other person doesn't know. Tandem learning 
is an ideal. We consciously tried to do it in that class. We only ever had 16 students. We tried to have eight L1 Spanish and eight L1 English. Sometimes we got around there and we did lots of work with that. Unfortunately, it's rather hard to construct those classes. Let me move on to what you're familiar with, small group teaching. Here, it's not a small group like this, twos and threes. Here, it's a group around a table. Uh, this is Ignacio Garcia, who was at the University of Western Sydney. This is actually in Tarragona. And we've got people here, I think he's teaching Trados. Okay, he's teaching a translation memory. And you can see lots of things happening. You've got over-the-shoulder teaching. You've got peer-to-peer -peer work here. You've got people um, learning by themselves. The good thing here is that with a large table, the teacher can move around. Uh, it's close enough for this person to speak to the whole group if necessary, or the teacher to move from over-the-shoulder teaching to general group teaching. Okay, so there's lots and lots of things going on there in that space in terms of interaction. And this is actually my favorite kind of teaching space uh, for working in. Okay, lots and lots. Uh, it's sort of hard to find big tables. I'm so pleased that at the University of Melbourne we do have classrooms with this kind of table and with somewhere to plug in your computers. You can see that was a main problem. We had to have lots and lots of cables there so people could plug in their electricity, uh, their, their, their computers. Where is the teacher? Um, there somewhere, anyway. Uh, beyond that, I mean, this, this is good. You're working together. You get to know each other quite well. I know that in all my master's programs and doctoral programs, we, we would do silly things like play football, have a barbecue, get drunk, and then play a football match after that, social activities. And I regret that, that we don't do that anymore. Uh, why do that? Why do these social activities? Well, you get to know each other on more than uh, the academic level. The social activity is not your private life, though, hey? I mean, it, it's a public event, people brought together. These are all people studying translation. That actually is Theo Hermans there, who looks particularly happy. I think his team must have won. Uh, we've got, what have we got? Two students, one from Barbados, two from Palestine. Uh, she's from England. This is Ayu from Nigeria, Carlo was an interpreter at the time at the European Commission. This is Este Torres, who took over the master program in Tarragona. Oh, and this is Na 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 Natasha, who is now editor of the journal, in the interpreter and translator trainer. So there you go. Humanized knowledge, we get to know all these people who might accept your article for publication, for example, okay. Uh, it's part of entering ongoing communities. You know, Kerali had this idea that the training, we're learning how to enter different communities. And this is very much a part of it because these people have stuck together afterwards. They know each other well enough to, to share emails, to engage in further uh, learning activities after what they've been doing there. So there's a connection with lifelong learning with a social basis, and they share knowledge between themselves as well. Okay, uh, those are different kinds of interaction, and I think they're all equally important when we're in the classroom. And you must remember that it's just not the teacher against the students. The students are, you know, it's not an enemy type thing or one, you know, it's not a binary opposition. There are many, many different ways that uh, teacher and students interact. I want to briefly look at, at, an, uh, at a lesson plan, actually. Uh, I'll put this on canvas, the actual lesson plan taken from a doctoral thesis done by Nune Ivazian a few years ago. And this is uh, an activity that she did in class and then studied it with uh, interviews, you know, videos and interviews, lots of analysis of how it worked. So she was looking at translation in additional language learning 
She picked a learning objective, which was here to teach students modals. So the outcome is you will know uh, that the modal system of English and the modal system, in this case, of Spanish. Okay, so uh, the first part of the class is looking at the modals, how they work in the grammars. And you get two grammar books and you interact with what? With the books. Kelly says this, the first interaction, it can be with the actual printed material. So here's how the modals work in English. Uh, you know, modals um, uh, can, should, have to, or to, may, okay? And they're quite tricky because you've got can and may are, uh, are quite ambiguous, all right? And then you line them up with the Spanish modals and there are not as many Spanish modals. So there's a problem, we can see it in the grammar, that lots of English modals, just a few Spanish modals, so the Spanish ones are not getting the, the details of the English ones. That's very abstract. And then we need an activity to do that. And because it's a translation activity, we can do comparative grammar here and then do things to test the comparative grammar. The activity in this case was going to be a mediated interview. They were going to interview or pretend, okay, a simulated interview with a politician about, let's see, the consequences of independence for Catalonia. Given the dates, there was a referendum coming up, an illegal referendum for Catalonia to be independent. So they're going to discuss a topic that is close to their hearts. About half the students are for independence, the other half are against it. So we know it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty, uh, well, they're going to be enthusiastic, say, okay? Now, the students are in groups and they prepare questions in English using lots of modals, using the English modals. Why are they doing this? Because then they're going to be in groups. Each group selects an interviewer and an interviewee. Okay, so television interviewer and the pretend politician. Uh, the interviewer asks in English, the interviewer goes into, in this case, Spanish, and then it comes back, okay? But the interpreter is from another team. So the students in this team have to prepare their questions and their answers uh, so that there are as many tricky questions and answers as possible in order to confuse the interpreter. Uh, this is deficit pedagogy, many would not approve, but the students in this case tend to like competitions. And so as they do this in front of the class, the rest of the class has to note down uh, when the interpreters get confused or make mistakes. Okay, and I think at the end, there's a follow-up discussion on the kinds of mistakes that were being used in this interlingual interaction. So are we training interviewers here? No, we're using translation in order to uh, concretize uh, comparative grammar. But it does address a, a quite serious problem between these two languages. Now, just looking at that, let's think of what kinds of interaction are involved. This is students interacting with a book, with two books, in that, actually. With, uh, well, they were put up on screen, so that it's in front of them, okay. Uh, and they had to do that comparison for themselves, and the teacher guided it, okay? Here, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. The students themselves have to prepare that interview. All this happens between the groups. The teacher is not talking here. The teacher is just giving instructions for begin and end. And the whole class is doing the evaluation. The teacher is not evaluating what happens. The class is. So uh, here you've got just, even though you've got just three people involved in the actual activity, everybody else is involved in following it and keeping score, if you like. And then the final section would be the teacher leading a discussion of how the mistakes can be amended with a question and answer session. So you can see here how it could be a two hour class and the teacher might talk really for 15 minutes sort of leading this activity, controlling this one, and um, mediating this last activity, 
uh, when the discussion goes on as to who made what mistakes. And then the teacher is the referee deciding which team wins because people this partic in this particular culture are quite competitive and they get very worked up about winning uh, one, team against, one team against another. Uh, the assessment of this activity is based on degree of interaction, not on how well or badly you use the modals. That tends to come as a result of the activity. Okay, now the question is, if we can do that kind of in-class activity, the question facing us now today is, how much of that uh, complexity of interaction can we then take online? Online learning may be bad because over-the-shoulder interaction is more difficult. It is rather hard for me to get into you individually uh, and have a conversation that is not overheard by the rest of the group. Not impossible, but just rather tricky if you have a large group. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is possible but tends not to work so well. And we've just done a very big survey. I've got lots of answers. I'll show you a few in a minute. And we find that uh, people are generally quite happy with online learning, but they all say that peer-to-peer -peer learning is what is most missing. Uh, people don't, students don't want to talk with each other or they don't want to turn on the video so they become humans uh, for each other. It's technically more difficult to move between interactions uh, like you can in that big table space where you can very quickly switch from one kind of interaction to another. And we know that because of technical difficulties, everything takes longer. So the lesson plans that we draw up for a two-hour face-to-face class, uh, we, we, don't get, we don't get to the end. We need another half hour, uh, usually, as, as you have been finding, I think. And then, obviously, we can't go and have the uh, barbecue and the football match online, much as we would like to. We can do other things. Here's how you answered, well, no, 20 of you, because not everybody has answered this online survey yet. This is how you answered uh, our questions very recently. Tutorials via Zoom, generally you're satisfied. Okay, this is pretty good, pretty encouraging. Only one person was dissatisfied and nobody extremely dissatisfied. So I, I find that pretty encouraging. We can do things online. However, Online is definitely not more engaging, it's less engaging, meaning there's less interaction, less involvement in the learning, and it is more confusing, you are telling us. Which is weird if you think about it. And three people nevertheless said online is as good as face-to-face. -face. So over here you're saying, you know, hey, I'm generally satisfied. And here you say, well, you know what, it's, it's not engaging and it's confusing. Uh, so we have to interpret this in various ways. And this is the one that interests me the most here at the moment. Uh, the, what, what's working well uh, online? Uh, the pre-recorded lectures, fair enough. Okay. The tutorials as a whole, the shared screens is fine. The breakout sessions gets a pretty good score under the circumstances. But then exchanges with other students, very low. Exchanges with the tutor, very low. So we can see that we're missing out on peer-to-peer -peer interaction and some kind of equivalent of over-the-shoulder interaction. And how, could, how could we, we can fix that up is a general pedagogical problem. I've put a recent discussion paper online um, for you to look at, and I'm hoping this is something we can discuss in the tutorial related with this activity. How can we improve interaction in those particular areas online? I look forward to discussing that with you very soon.